my Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind. Good morning and welcome once again. I am Pastor Steve. Today I would like to speak to you about decisions. You know, with that said, thank you for deciding to connect with us online. So glad you have joined us to hear God's Word. You know, John Maxwell, he said, Today is a day of decisions, as is every other day of my life. He goes on to say, In fact, I began the morning with the decision to get out of bed. My next decision was what to wear. As I confidently stepped out of the bedroom, my 10-year-old daughter took one look at me and said in her most gentle and loving way, Dad, the tie is okay, but you could have done much better with the jacket. Only 10 minutes into my day, and I had already made a bad decision. You know, our lives are basically a sequence of decisions. Google estimates that the average adult makes about 36,000, or sorry, 35,000 remotely conscious decisions per day each one with consequences that are both good and bad. They tell us that uh, a lot of them are are made even uh, decisions about food alone. You know, 226.7, they say. I don't know where they get the .7. You know, will I have dessert? What kind of dessert will I have? Uh, Maybe I will have the pie. Make a decision for the pie. What kind of pie? How big a piece of pie? Heated or not heated? Ice cream with it? Well, that's a no-brainer. I would have ice cream with mine. That'd be a a quick decision. You know, if my grade three math or my calculator is correct, we are only 29 days into the new year and already we have made approximately one million decisions, whether good or bad. I mean, just ordering pizza alone can elevate your decision-making count. You know, what brand or what kind, um, what size, type of crust, how many toppings, what toppings do you want on it? Do you want cheesy bread with it? Yes or no? Uh, Pickup or delivery, will that be cash? or debit. Places to eat. So many places to eat today. And uh, what, what am I going to drive? What vehicle to purchase? You know, gas, diesel, hybrid, electric, compact, midsize, crossover, SUV, pickup truck. Oh yeah, and what color? Well, you know, Henry Ford made it so easy. He said, you can have any color of vehicle you, you want, any color of car, as long as it is black. 
kind of takes all that uh, deciding out of it. And even when it comes to colors, you know, when we were kids in school, there was, you know, eight or ten basic colors. Now the options are endless and even mind-boggling. Dusty rose, periwinkle blue, all kinds of colors that maybe you've never heard of. Fuchsia. Our kitchen was Rockport gray. And then recently we decided to repaint our living room. We came up with two shades of gray, one a, a contrasting wall. Uh, the two colors, rainy days and iced queen. I'd never heard of them before, but apparently they're the most popular on the market right now. Take the color green, for example. The green alone, there's lime green, there's forest green, spring green, jungle green, jade green, emerald green, British racing green. Shall I go on? There's hunter green, pine fern green, bright green. Well, I will go on a little further. For the farmers, there's Oliver Green and John Deere Green. I think you're getting it. All jokes aside, those of us with normal color vision have approximately 7 million cones in our eyes that enable us to distinguish 10 million different colors. I, I saw that statistic, that, that fact, and I just was mind-boggled by it. You know, choosing the right color may not be a huge game-changer in the course of your life, but other decisions may have a huge impact immediately and or down the road. You know, if you are like me, uh, you have made some decisions you regret and maybe some you would like to forget. Often we as Christians struggle to make the right choices. Paul himself struggled in this area, knowing what was right, and often he chose the wrong thing. He admitted that. You know, we may use a variety of methods when making choices. You have maybe tried a few different ones. Let me give you a few. You know, there's the process of elimination. That's sometimes a good one. There's the random Bible reading. Someone called it dipping, you know, where you, you flip your Bible open um, and you put your finger on a passage and you, you, you look for direction in that. Um, there's delegating or letting someone else decide. I often have done that at the restaurant. I'll let my friends decide or my wife, and I say, you know, I'll have the, some of the same. I'll have the very same thing. Maybe sitting on it, not doing anything. Sometimes that's an option. We don't want to make a decision. Thinking, using logic instead of emotions. That might be a good thing to try. Dreaming or asking for advice, looking for something in the clouds. Putting out fleeces. Flipping a coin. We've all tried some of those at one time or another. Maybe you have tried um, something else to make a decision. Maybe you could give me a few tips because I find it hard sometimes to come up with the right decision. But I would like us to look at five basic principles when, when making decisions as God's people. You know, if you are taking notes, my number one point, I'll warn you it's the longest point, but I think it's the most important. My number one point is go to the Lord. Don't wait until you're in a, in a pickle or between a rock and a hard place or until you are desperate to call on Him. Go to him first. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer thee and show you great and mighty things. And then over in Psalms 25 and 4, Show me your way, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Ask him. Sometimes we have not because we ask not. Too many Christians have that independent spirit, making decisions based on popular opinions or allowing their emotions to dictate what they decide. Let me remind you what the Bible says, that the heart is deceitful above all else. It can't be trusted many times. And so, in Proverbs 3, the Psalm, or Solomon, the wisest man, he says, Trust in the Lord, the Lord, with all your heart. Don't lean to your own way of thinking or understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will give you direction for your paths, for the way you go. And then he also says in chapter 3 and 7, Be not wise in your own eyes. You know, the prodigal could have saved himself so many problems and difficulties if he had just went to his father and asked what his father wanted him to do, and he obeyed him. God knows what's ahead. He knows everything about you. He is acquainted with all your ways, and he loves you more than anyone else. You know, some people just think they know it all, and so they don't ask, but God actually does know it all. He's a good guy to go to for advice. There were six blind men and they were brought to see an elephant. Of course, they couldn't see the elephant. You know, the first guy, he touched the side of the elephant. He said, it's, it's much like a wall as he touched the elephant. The second one said, it's like a spear as he stroked the elephant's tusk. The third man taking the elephant's squirming trunk claimed it was more like a snake. Nonsense, said the fourth man as he wrapped his arms around the 
elephant's great big legs. He said, it's like a tree. While the fifth man grabbing the, the beast by the ear, he imagined it as a fan. And lastly, the final guy grabbed the elephant's tail and said, it was much like a rope. You see, we only see in part. Um, and uh, our perspective is very limited. We get uh, into jams, you know, on the 401. I was thinking about this. Uh, driving down the 401, and we get into a traffic jam, which could have been avoided if we knew what was up ahead. You listen to 680 AM, and sometimes they have the aircraft way up above, and they have a different perspective. And if you listen to the news, maybe you can get off at an exit and avoid a, a two-hour traffic jam. But God, he sees very well. He has perfect perspective, and he can see on ahead what's going to happen, what's, what there is, maybe a danger or something you need to, to look for. He knows all of that. I guess you get that, that God knows everything. Well, in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, we read that his ways are much higher than ours. Colossians 1 and 25, God's foolishness is greater than our wisdom. So we need to acknowledge God in all our ways. How? How do we do that? Do we shave our head or do we hide out in a cave or come up with some special chant? Well, first of all, to acknowledge him is not to ignore him or to look everywhere else, or to be oblivious to his presence. You know, if you all turned away as I'm speaking today and, and started uh, talking to your neighbor or falling asleep or walked out, maybe closed your eyes, that would be a lack of acknowledgement. We acknowledge someone by having an awareness of their presence, by looking to them, by listening intently and making eye contact. You know, I've walked into a room before when my grandkids were on their iPad or their iPhone, and they were total, totally oblivious to me. And even when I would start talking, they didn't even hear me. They weren't acknowledging me. We need to acknowledge God. Francis Schaeffer said, God's leading is only for those who are already committed to do as he may choose. There's no point in asking him for advice if your mind is already made up or if you only have one answer in mind. And too often, we only want God's will if it lines up with our own will. I love what Jesus' brother James says in chapter 1 and 5. He says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. He wants to give us wisdom, but we have to ask him. What about the Holy Spirit in our decisions? So important. John 16 and 13 explains that when the Spirit of truth has come upon you, he will lead you into all truth. You know, it has been said that the main role of the Spirit is to help us understand what God's Word is already saying to us. Well, you know, that was a long first point, as I said. The remaining four, I will try and move along a little quicker with them. Number two, understand God's principles. What are some absolutes in God's Word? You know, just like at home you were growing up and you had some rules in your home. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were some absolutes, some, some no-nos, some things that were non-negotiable that you knew to be true from your parents. Maybe they had them written on the wall, but you knew you should not ever forget to obey those rules. Well, there are many absolutes found in, in the Bible in God's Word, and some begin with, you probably know them. Maybe you could repeat them all, thou shalt not. No need to wonder, you know, should I, should I kill my neighbor? Um, should I steal that car, or should I cheat on my wife? There is no guesswork regarding some decisions, some that you don't even need to pray about. Ephesians 5 and 17, Therefore, do not be unaware, but understand what the will of the Lord is. As you become more and more familiar with the handbook, more decisions become no-brainers. Well, what about things that are not written in black and white in God's Word? You know, should I smoke or drink or hang around with those that do? Someone said, smoking won't send you to hell. You'll just smell like you've been there. You know, God, it's God that created our bodies. And there's the things you can pick up in God's Word um, because He cares about our, our whole being. You know, that we, we should know it's not a good idea. It's unhealthy to put smoke in our lungs. What about gambling? You know, I hear so much today, and it bothers me, uh, advertisements continually about gambling. Maybe the Bible doesn't come out and say, thou shalt not gamble. But if you look to Proverbs especially, Solomon gives us some great, great big tips and hints that gambling is not a good idea. Should I watch that movie? Should I get married or should I just live with that person? 
What are the dangers? How will it affect my spiritual life? How will it affect my testimony? What about my kids? How will it affect them? 1 Corinthians 10 and 23, Paul says, All things are permitted, but not all things are, are, are of benefit. All things are permitted, but not all things build up or edify. Howard Hendricks said, The will of God is found right here in the Word of God. And yet sometimes the Bible is misused. Knowingly or unknowingly, it may be taken out of context. It may be tweaked to fit our own selfish desires. There's a classic story of a young man who used the point and flip method in his Bible. And one day, wondering what to do with his life, he flipped his Bible open and pointed to Matthew 27 and 5. And he read, Jesus went out and hanged himself. He thought, maybe he should try again. And this time he landed on Luke 10 and 27 and said, go and do that likewise. This wasn't working very well for him, but he thought he would give it one more try. And he landed on John 13 and 27, and he read, whatever you do, do quickly. You know, we may laugh at that, but that is mishandling God's word. It can even be dangerous. His word is not a magic Ouija board. Am I saying it can't ever work? No, I've tried it. It may have worked for me once, but, but be careful that you read all of God's word, that you know his heart. Well, that's two points. Number three, moving along quickly, investigate your options. You know, I think God has given us this gray matter between our ears for good reason. Common sense that unfortunately today is not very common. What about purchasing a vehicle for a family of six? You know, a two-seater Corvette or a Miata is not really a good idea. Do your homework um, on a car. Consider the price, the size, the resale, the reliability Warranty, is it practical for my family? What color should I get? Well, I, I could maybe help you with that. I would pick a red one. You know, if math is not your thing, don't take a job in accounting. Accounting may be a good career, but maybe not a good choice for you. <clears throat> if you have a poor balance, don't join the circus and try to do tricks on the high wire. Number four. Two more points. Proverbs, discuss it with others. Discuss your decisions with others. Talk to people about it. Proverbs 15 and 22, Solomon tells us that there is wisdom in the counsel of many. J.I. Packer said, don't be a spiritual lone ranger. You know, I knew someone who over and over, they would barrel ahead on their own and make poor choices, and then they would go asking for help. Proverbs 12, 15 Another great word of wisdom, Solomon says, A fool is right in his own eyes, but he who needs counsel, who heeds counsel, is wise. Ask the right people, people that are trusted, tried, true, a good rep reputation and a track record. Not just someone who will tell you what you want to hear, will tell you the truth. But on that same note, don't canvas the town either. That may muddy the waters. Too many voices. A man starting a fish business hung up a sign, fresh fish for sale today, and invited his friends for the grand opening. They all congratulated him, but one suggested his sign might be improved. Why do you say fresh fish today? Of course it's today. It's not yesterday or tomorrow. So he removed the word today. Another said, why does it say for sale? Everyone knows that you are selling fish because you have a store. So off came that part of the sign too. And then another complaint why the word fresh? Your integrity guarantees every fish to be fresh. Sometimes too many voices can be confusing. You know, there is no command that states we should listen to everyone. Often we need to sift through all this information coming at us today. I kind of like to say it like this. We need to eat the worms and spit out the germs. The psalmist said we are blessed if we avoid walking in the counsel of the ungodly. So be mindful. I encourage you to be mindful of your source. Where is it coming from? Is it reliable? Let me just say, we are faced with many decisions that are neither right nor wrong. And this is my fifth point. Exercise your freedom, your God-given freedom. I think that God is, giving, is into giving us some room, some space, and the freedom I just mentioned. He may want to mother us, but God doesn't want to smother us. I don't think it's a, a big deal to God what color of socks I wear to church, nor does he want me to be anxious about that. I would say, though, try to have the match, would you? I think I've had the two different colors one time. 
I'm pretty sure God gives me the freedom to decide the color to paint our living room. I, didn't, I just confess, I didn't pray about that one. I didn't look for a verse, God, what color should I paint this room? I didn't look for an answer in the Bible either or a sign. I did one smart thing forever. However, I did listen to my wife. I asked her advice. And if you're, you're married today, let me make that point. Run things by your spouse. Don't be a lone ranger in your marriage either. Work together on things and, and seek one another's advice and look for wisdom. The Bible says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You know, I don't really care if my kids are digging ditches or they're in full-time ministry. Am I proud of them in ministry? Yes, but I didn't put pressure on them for their career choices. I tried to help them and guide them. I just want them to do well and serve the Lord and enjoy life. And for me to have a great relationship with them. Maybe you're here today and you have made some bad choices in your life. Maybe you have some tough decisions before you today. You're trying to make the right choice. You know, the most important decision you will ever make is to follow Christ. If you're listening today and you've never done that, I would say do not delay. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you that you are the God who wants to help us. As we seek you, as we look to you, maybe we've made some mistakes and we've made some poor choices. I believe you can help us with that. You're the God who is gracious and full of mercy and love, but help us to turn to you and ask for your help. I pray for that one today that is, has a, a tough decision to make today. Maybe it's financially or re, regarding their health. Lord, maybe a caregiver or something they have to face as far as an operation or whatever. To make a choice, I pray you would help them. You would give them peace. You would speak clearly to them through your word and through other loving Christians. Lord, I pray also for that one that has never made that decision, that the best decision of their lives to follow you, to decide to turn their life over to you and, uh, and let you be the master and the controller and, and allow you to guide them through life each step of the way. So I thank you for your word today. Help us to follow it, to love it, to, to listen to it, to look to you for advice. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.